we have a very special guest on the podcast today a world renowned algebraic number theorist dr sujata ramdurai was recently awarded one of the highest civilian awards by the indian government the padma shri she is a canada research chair at the university of british columbia and was previously a professor at the tata institute of fundamental research i am delighted to welcome such a distinguished mathematician on the show who's also my childhood friend we went to the same school and college welcome to spotlight uh, sujan thank you sandhya let me begin by congratulating you on being awarded the padma shri thanks again you won prestigious awards earlier you were the first uh, indian to win the international center for theoretical physics ramanujam prize you won the shanti swarup bhatnagar award which is the highest honor in scientific field by the indian government and you also got the kreger nelson prize by the canadian mathematical society for your exceptional contribution to mathematics research and getting the padma shri award by your the government of your own country for the field of science and engineering how does it feel it feels great and actually i'm glad that you called it from the government of your own country because i think the media had reported an indo canadian and then suddenly i got a flurry of calls checking if i was indian or canadian had i given up my indian citizenship etc etc so it's always nice to be recognized uh, anywhere but particularly nicer when it is from your own homeland that's good so let's talk about your area of research and how it impacts the world <laughs> that's a tough one sandhya because i work in an area of pure mathematics and especially an area where uh, algebra and number theory you know these are names people have heard so these it's a co- at the confluence of these two areas but within that area i work in last few years i've been working in what's called iwasawa theory this is an area which was pioneered by a japanese research mathematician iwasawa called kenkichi iwasawa started out in the 1970s and uh, it's kind of difficult to explain what its connection to the real world is but mathematics by nature is like that you know you do mathematics just because it challenges you especially pure blue sky research as we call it and then some day somewhere it finds useful i can give you the simplest example with prime numbers all of us learn prime numbers never knowing what they are good for and so on and then it's there's evidence to show that you know different two civilizations in different parts of the world dealt with prime numbers and thought about prime numbers the earliest known return record goes back to at least 2 to 3000 bc so humanity has thought about thought about prime numbers for a very long time research mathematicians have taken it ahead how to be how do we find out large primes and so on but if you asked even 100 years ago if you ask people what's the use of prime numbers they might not know or, or they might not have an answer but today prime numbers lie at the core of internet cryptography for instance each time you use your internet banking account or you do any secure transaction there's a prime number behind it so mathematics by its nature is like that it's perhaps is one of those subjects which has a longest shelf life next to maybe then in literature where people can quote from ulysses or uh, you know old classics but apart from that mathematics is one area where the results are continuously used it's not as if some result just gets useless after a while so my area of research is our theory basically like at, at its very you know simplest terms i can say we all want to solve equations and we want to understand where the solutions lie and so if you try to do it with equations where the coefficients are all over integers or over, over the rational numbers then it gets you know it's a difficult question and uh, for instance um you know for the last 3 400 years we know that solving equations is closely related to another area of mathematics called group theory and galois theory and so on but we don't understand fully the what's called the galois group of the field of rationals so if you understand the galois group it sort of tells you where the solutions to equations lie and uh, in algebraic number theory we want to understand studying solutions of equations over the rational numbers and that's a tough question you know we only understand part of the picture and then mathematics sort of tells you you know okay this is what things should look like but then mathematics is also driven by rigor so we want to prove that 
a certain intuition or a certain conjecture is right so my area is broadly tied to those kind of questions that's really fascinating and it's good to know that you know the work that you're doing now would have an impact for generations to come i think that's a very hard to if at all if at all there is an impact it will come from unexpected quarters and we won't know when where and so on but that's the nature of research in pure mathematics great you know i want to know um how did you become interested in maths you know did you i remember the time when you were in school and we used to have fun together in the summer holidays and things like that you secretly your brain was already working on you being a mathematician <laughs> it to some extent yes you you know my late brother kumar right so all our summer holidays used to be spent in city central libraries for us holidays meant going to the library and then reading comics and then also kumar used to have this ability to sniff out various things and then we would get deeper into that read uh, books and so on but the other big thing i remember about the summer holidays is waiting for the textbooks from the next class right and in our family we had a tradition they would never buy two sets of new books one of them would be hand me down second hand books and one would be new books and we had to take turns if i got new books this year then kumar got new books next year and so on and then as soon as we could get our hands on the textbooks for the next class kumar would devour the english book and i would devour the math books trying to find out okay how much of these problems can i solve how much do i remember from my last year and then gingerly trying to read the new chapters by myself and then i think the key to my liking for mathematics was this understanding that you didn't need a strategy or a tactic to do well in that subject all you needed was to understand and then once you had understood then you know it was just practice for me it was this abstract component to mathematics that i liked and then the realization that you know if you understood it then you could do well without having to remember things so do you feel that the environment in which you grew up also enabled you know you had a sibling who was also equally interested and you were more or less the same age so you were studying together what about the environment in your in the school what about the environment at home the family yeah yeah definitely i think all those and i think also the larger societal environment you know those were days where you really respected studies and there was a really respected doing well in class and then uh, different than you know being labeled a nerd you were genuinely people were respectful of you if you did well in class and then at home my grandmother who was an inspiration both for me and my brother she always used to lament the fact that she couldn't study beyond fourth standard and her continuous message to us was you don't know how lucky you are that you have an education and it's unforgivable if you don't use that and uh, you know so that sort of and then when we did well in class and scored let's say full marks in mathematics everybody would talk about it oh look she scored full marks again and then my parents had this very interesting uh, um i don't know if it was a strategy but whatever it was it i think it was very effective so they would our pocket money was the number of we i don't know sandhya if you remember we used to have monthly tests do you remember yes. yes of course yeah. <laughs> so our our uh, pocket money was the number of paise we scored in the monthly tests all right and, and if we scored full marks is any subject then it got double that's and then mathematics was the one where you could try and score full marks so often that was one of the motivation to practice and practice and learn more and so on oh those were days when it seems life was way simpler and our needs were very simple also you know, everything was focused on doing well and in studies it's a different yeah. era yeah it's a different era and the time you spent thinking and arguing you know i think that's something that's a serious loss in the very real sense to much of humanity now that people just don't think somebody else does the thinking as you you said and yes. most often it's what's up university that does the thinking and fact finding for you okay coming back to math there are a few people like you who take to the subject well but for most students or for at least can i say many students it's a stumbling block how do you think this can be changed especially in india the reason for that i mean mathematics is one of those subjects just as 
necessity uh, a key to understanding key to doing well in the subject is the necessity of understanding the subject in a way it also works against the subject because what happens is when students don't understand the fundamentals then you can't build on it and so they students end up having this you know shaky foundation and then that soon turns into fear and all of that is because they haven't really understood and the way our schools go up ahead you know the focus is on finishing the curriculum finishing the syllabus so they don't really dwell on okay how can we spend time making the student understand this and so on and then the student actually develops this fear of mathematics and it stays with the student and then later it turns to hatred and then meanwhile society has also sort of accepted this notion that it's all right not to do well in mathematics so typically when i tell people that i am a mathematician then i'm always ready for two reactions one is oh my god you know and it's almost an instant recoiling or the other is oh i always used to like mathematics but unfortunately i couldn't do it so it's never something measured it's two extremes and i think the key to making any student love any subject is to try and wait for the student to understand the subject try to give the student more aids especially in the early years whether it's reading or science or mathematics and these are things we are seriously lagging behind and of course the challenge to mathematics is also this component of abstraction which i think students have trouble grappling with that which is very odd because if you go back through history or even mythology there were great mathematicians in india at some point we seem to have given up that intuitive liking for the subject you started initiatives in education along with your husband ram you have a foundation and you created the ramanujan math park can you elaborate on these suja let me first talk about this uh, gyanam foundation by, by you know this was when i was part of the national knowledge commission and we traveled around the length around the country trying to get feedback from teachers about uh, what can be done to improve education and one of the subjects i handled was math and science how to get more students interested in math and science because there was this realization that if india really had to develop then you needed innovation and math and science are key areas for this innovation and then the number of students doing mathematics and pure sciences was alarmingly dropping you know by the year and so we were focusing on that and when we consulted with teachers i realized that it was all well to sit in the ivory towers of tata institute and complain about how students coming didn't know anything and so on and so forth while the ground reality the teachers especially in the public school system there were many teachers who were trying to do their best but they hardly had any resources and internet was at its fledgling early years in those times and then we were talking of india becoming a global power and all the citizens becoming global citizens and i realized that there was no comparison we were not even on equal grounds students elsewhere had access to different resources any time you know they just had to log on to the internet and they could access a wide variety of resources whereas in india all the students had was were textbooks and which nobody was reading and the teachers were focusing on quote and quote finishing the syllabus while being sent off or caste censuses cow censuses vote various things so i realized that you know one of the first things that's needed is credible online resources and technology enables that technology makes that possible and i am not a believer in displacing teachers but i am a firm believer that enabling teachers by way of creating more resources aligned to the indian school system will really change the ground reality so i set about uh, and one of uh, my not, not 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 my colleagues but somebody i knew his name was rajesh kasturi rangan he was in niyas and he and i you know discussed this and he said our textbooks are good which i still believe our textbooks ncert textbooks are good but it's just that nobody reads them and how do we use technology to amplify that textbook so he came up uh, with the, both of us said no we should do that and i offered to do it for math and then the hope was students would use that students parents teachers 
and then teachers would get inspired and later own it and this could be replicated along subjects and just imagine social studies or biology today with today's technology you can actually the child can actually see a cell division right and so we set about trying to make presentations based on the textbook and ultimately everybody gave up but i stuck to it and uh, took inputs from teachers wanted to wanted it to become a movement what i called gyan dan and today we have uh, resources online resources aligned to the ncert textbook up to class 8 i'm we are currently a team of us are working on class 9 but sadly nobody else seemed to have shared the same passion and i wanted to do it pro bono you know i mean didn't want to make meanwhile as we all know in the last 10 years especially post covid the number of edtech startups people talk proudly about that whereas i've always been saying but that by now the government should have created enough resources in multiple languages in india yeah with the government resources it's only a, 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 that much simpler to scale these up exactly think- exactly but the you know let me give you a simple example for instance google can translate phd level papers you know in specialized areas of mathematics i i have i regularly have my phd students doing a first level translation from uh, papers in russian or german or french mathematics high level mathematics papers and then i only need to spend one or two hours with them and then it's almost as good as the original in english and then we work on that you know i guide my students you know but there's nothing like that available for school resources that's a pity yeah and the government by now should have created its own translation mechanisms it's worse in fact for a single english word you'll find multiple kannada words for the same english word uh, technical math word depending on the year of the textbook so we you know imagine this scenario you pr- bring the best student who has scored who has stopped in mathematics from across india put them all in a same room and they cannot talk mathematics because they have probably learned this in different languages they don't have a common language and unfortunately this is going to hold us back because today science is a collective endeavor those days of somebody some scientist sitting locked up by himself or herself somewhere and discovering new ideas is not really the way things work today the more access you have to information the quicker you can transmit what you have discovered and discussed with others that's the way to progress that's a quicker way to progress so collaboration is the key to any human advancement in this absolutely category. yeah absolutely and so right now for instance i'm also trying to create a glossary of the corresponding mathematical terms and then those corresponding terms in as many indian languages as possible and that's not been easy yes like you pointed out there are so many options but only a native speaker of that language we know which is the apt one in that particular situation but the, for a scientific purpose there's no need for to have so many words you just need one word exactly one word but even among native speakers that's the danger when you do uh, the translation because i had this interesting experience i think it was in marathi where there was one word you know like i can give you an example for instance uh, take the word field okay in english it's field now we know that field colloquially has some other meaning you know it has a variety of meanings even in english right it can mean an area it can mean a playing field but a field is a mathematical word when you look at this word in mathematics you know what it is right. so it has a different connotation when it is in mathematics so it should be not just a native speaker but it should be a native speaker who is a mathematics teacher who knows the correct word for that otherwise they can colloquially translate it to kshetra or something like that which is perhaps not i don't know what the corresponding word for field is in hindi but you need to find the right technical word for that okay so how is it progressing this glossary of uh, mathematical terms i'm, I'm trying hard I've, i've sort of you know some of the languages are still missing and you'll be surprised hindi has been one of the most difficult for me to find uh, volunteers or people who are willing to do that you know pro pro bono or even oh, i'm surprised i mean perhaps we should give this more publicity i i would think that this is something that people would love to be part of because we just going to be sharing knowledge and enriching society by doing it yeah yeah i know it, it won't take too to much time yeah perhaps we should consider doing some kind of a you know um a campaign 
that will reach out all these people yeah and- we need to plan that because the way i want to do that is for teachers to be equal stakeholders in the sense you know not top down is not going to work you cannot create something and impose it on the teachers hmm but they feel part of it and and let's admit it you know that days of talk and talk are over or at least it, they're not by themselves enough because students engage with learning in a different way than you and i did their attention spans are less they are more comfortable with devices they don't read but that doesn't stop them i don't think these should be viewed solely as impediments to learning they can also enhance learning so we need to find the right way to do that and there and teachers also need to be content creators because if they need to make an impact they should also engage with these new media whether i am not a big fan of all these new media but that we should find you know yeah that so was still a question about you know how there is this very mixed reactions about uh, chat gpt and its ilk you know is it good is it bad is it a mixture of things how do you think it's going to impact um, studies and how is it going to impact society oh it's like everything else everything has its two edged sword right and then i i am a firm believer in regulation so for instance i mean to, from my own experience during covid when all the classes were online i know students struggle but then i go back after two years after covid you know i realize that the students i teach those two years have been they have not learned anything but you look at their grades it doesn't reflect their state of knowledge in that subject and it was clear that you know um there was a i i i can't say that the exams were conducted with full integrity and so on and so forth but at the same time it created a lot of resources in the sense because people were not attending classes because people were lecturing online they put up a lot of material online and i think that at least for me it taught that you can use this to sift out the really motivated people because they used all these resources very very efficiently so chat gpt unfortunately is the same story you know the students can use it for quicker learning but again i suspect it's not going to be that way it's just going to be one of the tools that spreads misinformation right and that's i think the reason is because there are not enough educators who are part of these what do you mean by that let's let's go back to edtech let's go over let's take one step back from uh, chat gpt so what is this whole story of edtech so on the one hand there are educators by whom i mean teachers teachers who have spent years in the classroom and who have understood students and who know the different kinds of barriers that can exist to learning and so on and then on the other hand you have all these uh, startup wizards who see this as an opportunity and techies who see this as an opportunity possibly to become the next unicorn and so on and then the two of them don't meet so teachers are afraid that they are going to be left out by all this new fancy technology and then the uh, the techies believe that they don't need teachers whereas i don't believe in either of those two extremes and i think the right way would have been for a tech person to actually sit down with teachers and find out you know what have you learned in all your years as a, as a teacher and can you help me can we do something together so that we overcome this education problem in this country given the diversity in our country given the lack of resources and given the number of first generation learners you know yes. unless we look at this problem comprehensively and in a wholesome way it's not going to get solved okay my next question is something that i have to ask you you know we are by now far past the stage of stereotypes of maths is not for women but are there enough women in your field if not how can the numbers be increased well even globally i wouldn't say there are enough women in the field but uh, it's increasing and then in the west there are a lot of initiatives which have worked wonders for instance networking events so there are conferences run by women and then many and then again this is not something where women plot it's not something to be seen in that uh, light but it's something which is done in a very cooperative manner you know so for instance we have uh, what's called women in numbers so that's a group and then there are number theory conferences where you know preponderantly more women there's a preponderance of women 
and then it's also a kind of networking event like the seniors will talk to the juniors and talk to them often it's just sharing experiences that works so they you know they'll give advice to younger uh, job seekers about how they should handle a job interview and if it's a two body problem namely husband and wife are both looking for jobs how do you negotiate the pathways and so on so that's been a very successful uh, model and now it's been replicated across streams within mathematics and also in other uh, science areas and i think this has contributed in no mean way to larger numbers of women getting into mathematics and then what also in the west what many agencies do is you know they say all right you can have you can organize a conference we'll give you funding only if certain percentage of your speakers certain percentage of your organizing committee etc cetera, etc cetera, or women at all levels there's a representation of uh, women and in fact even um the larger uh, i would say m- minorities you know so it tries to be inclusive and then funding is tried to demonstrating this inclusion and in a sense it might appear forced you can do these things in the west and where you can actually negotiate where you can say look i'm sorry i would like to but unfortunately you know there are not enough women in this area and one of the things that i want to do is to address this problem by having one whole session where panelists discuss how we can do this so that when we have a similar conference in say 5 years our goal is to increase the percentage from x to y and so on uh, those things are slowly catching on in india also and uh, and in fact the united nations a few years back did this very serious study on the gender gap project in science where they had actual figures and where they tried to understand uh, this is not a, a one problem fits all kind of solution a uh, kind of uh, problem right the problem and the reasons for the problem could be different in different geographical areas in different cultures and, sorry and in different cultures too you know it, it exactly is, yeah so they, really yes so they tried to take all that into account and then uh, shape the data accordingly and so on and so uh, it has helped i mean in india also now for the last few years we have regular women in math meetings and then many of the uh, conference organizing you know there are some pres- prestigious conference organizing venues so those places have sort of agreed to say okay we will leave two weeks you know those slots can only be filled up by events focusing on inclusion and so on so those things have helped but it's still a long way to go i feel in india so you know uh, what is your opinion about funding for uh, you know pure science or theoretical maths and science i know industry backs uh, applied research but is there enough funding for it i wouldn't say industry backs applied research even in india industry okay. there should be more involvement of industry i mean first of all i am a firm believer that the government can do more you know each time they commit every successive government from independence says we are going to increase uh, the percentage of gdp in research but it's one step upwards and four steps downwards you now we've never reached even the 2% it's i think it varies from 0.3% to 0.8% whereas china i think is closer it's above 1% and that's and that's in the last few years once it began booming and then you can see the transformation on the ground china the publications from china are now are overtaken uh, united states or you know the innovation indices that have gone up in and so on so i firmly believe that the government should be a serious player it doesn't take much it's not you know okay big projects take a lot of money and that's not going to happen every year right they can focus on big projects once in a few years but there should be consistent unstinting support for higher education and research i wouldn't say just higher education primary education secondary education tertiary maybe there can be a few private players but the government shouldn't let the arena just for tertiary education open to private players that's my firm belief similarly wherever we are in science you know when they'll say okay it's just like the usual comparison with public sector and i'm not a believer in saying who people i don't believe that investing in the public sector post independence was a drain on our country the amount of human capital we built up is astounding we are where we are today whether it's as an it uh, or in the services sector or getting the next new vaccine up and running is because we had all those investments no and i feel that i mean industry has never been industry always likes to complain that the people churned out are not good enough for them 
while they never do anything concrete to try and get involved in education and so on why do you think the government is lagging behind in supporting this kind of investment or investing enough in education as in the past what has I, led to this kind I of don't know. to be charitable to the government i can say maybe they don't realize nobody has explained to them fully the strengths of investing in education and people have only told them the losses or the drain story the drain part of the story but then i also think that the government doesn't take a long term view of these things it's always from one election to the other and scientists are a small vote bank that they can ignore so what we see is obviously the brain drain as you know the media likes to call it when there are not enough opportunities here the brightest brains will choose to go somewhere else where they have enough opportunities to pursue their work that is something that I mean, needs to be changed absolutely and i mean i would say when we were in the national knowledge commission i used to look at the previous commissions and the reports and then you know all those commission reports are such fine documents even if a quarter of those recommendations had been recommend uh, had been implemented from the 60s we would be in a different place and uh, but that's never happened and i i really i failed to understand why i mean we still there was at least sandhya when you and i when we were students 70s 80s there was this respect for teachers but today even that is gone you know there's only respect for startups in education where they make a lot of money and not for the real sloggers who are the teachers and i feel i mean this is something society needs to change and uh, then that signal has to go to the government or the other way around the government has to recognize the role the teachers and for instance even health workers they play you know you all this doesn't happen in a vacuum just because you say you know some big mission and so on they have to stick to the gra- stick to the uh, long term strategy and make some aspects of that mission politics proof in the sense it doesn't matter whether a co- government comes or goes the results have been so good that no government can afford to trace its steps back so one example along those lines would be the sarva shiksha abhiyan which the uh, vajpayee government i think it was that started it but then people saw its value and, and no government could cut funding to that and so on whereas most of the other schemes are typically fly by term you know so one term they'll implement some scheme it's never carried forward it's undone so whatever progress was made then you go back four steps and this short term view should just be gotten rid of and i don't know how we can make that happen i absolutely agree that we need to discuss this more and that should be part of a you know intellectual collective collaborative effort I just have two more questions you would like to answer them. One um is uh, you know do you think that scientists should be part of the intellectual collective who participate or get involved in concerns of civil society? And the second question is would you want to talk about your health concerns and how you deal with it? Do you think there is a a kind of a message there for people i would leave the second one out i've done a tech talk on that but for the first one it's the answer is a resounding yes and at all levels from policy to civil society you know we can dive okay. right into that question now of you know the how important you do you think that it is for scientists to join other intellectuals and address the concerns of civil society it is very important and i think scientists have had a tradition of doing that you know i mean speaking up against violence or speaking up against uh, policies but the question is whether their voices are heard even in advanced countries even in developed countries you know let alone developing countries right so their voices are you know typically it's a photo op when somebody wins a big prize but then otherwise uh, how often does the government seriously invite somebody like cna rao you know the famous scientist from bangalore who was the chairperson for the scientific advisory council to the prime minister when i was part of it you would say look at the number of economists who are come who are invited to come and speak at uh, in the parliament and compare it with the number of scientists who have been invited so, <laughs> so is it because they like you said in, to in answer to an earlier question is it because they don't understand the importance of what scientists are doing and how they can contribute to making the country better or is it they just don't take the scientists seriously no no i think one reason i, I can they i don't think the government pays any attention 
you know, wants to pay any attention. So typically, like I say, it's part of the strategy. You know, you have to have a vision. This is what we, this is where we are. This is where I want to be. And then see how to get from there to there. And there you have to be honest. And I think one of the things that people are not comfortable with is science. If you're a scientist, then you're honest. You know, you know the limitations of what you say and the limitations of what can be achieved. And maybe people don't like to hear those. Perhaps I mean, I cannot promise, a scientist cannot promise that India will be, you know, a 5 trillion economy in <laughs> whatever number of years, right? Whereas an economist can go and say, if you do this, that, 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 we can have, we can become that. Whereas a scientist will clearly say, look, these are our challenges. We have to overcome these challenges. There's something dispassionate in a scientist's uh, speech. And I don't think it goes down well with different sections. So let's end this discussion on a positive now. So the need of the hour seems to be that all people in government or in, you know, in startups and lay people should all develop a scientific temperament. That used to be a buzzword, which seems to have fallen by the wayside, you know, swept away by the currents of history, as if I can be allowed that poetic license. So how do we revive it, Suja? What do you think we can do? I think to tell the students and to get the kids interested in science, to manage the curiosity side of science. But at the same time, I mean, scientific temper, all that is okay. But at the same time, there's also, I don't know if you know of this book by this thought, uh, I mean, I, who I like very much, a philosopher called Feyerabend. Uh, he was European and he wrote a book or a series of essays called The Tyranny of Science. So you see, everywhere it became scientific. Any method got respect if it was called scientific. Though, so that led to a lot of quackery scientific adjective, right? I would say the, you know, scientists ask for very little. And I think if you want to really progress, then you know the limitations and then give a clear picture, but then achieve what you say you can achieve. And this can be done with limited amount of funding when you compare the funding or when you compare the amount spent across uh, different areas. And I think there should be this commitment at all levels. And I think sadly that's missing. And I think India benefited in the early years, you know, I mean, 50s to 70s, look at where we were and what we achieved in terms of eradicating polio and then becoming a vaccine uh, leader in terms of administration of polio vaccine and the lessons we learned by it. One other thing, Sandhya, which I think is important, is we have focused too much on just science and technology, you know. And if you look at, and I think uh, that's also part of the problem. We should look at, and especially today with a whole parallel digital world emerging, scientists should be aware of humanities and conversely. Humanities, there should be a history of science subject taken seriously and so on and all of this boils down in the end to intellectual curiosity and then being honest about your intellectual underpinnings and also your intellectual ambitions which are in a way tied up with our national ambitions yes i think they can all go together pretty well if people were to realize and set goals and work towards it you know it has to be a concerted effort yeah absolutely i mean let me give you a simple example for instance you spoke about uh india's strengths and so on right for instance i'm really take it's really so surprising when i am i'm i don't i'm not an expert on vedas or anything like that but i'm curious and when i try to read about what what is there in the vedas or try to understand those translations and so on what strikes me is how easily they grapple with large numbers you know which i think is it's quite uh, amazing and then they never go wrong uh, in the sense of what is a kalpa what is a yuga how many years how many years of human years equals how many god years and so on they dealt with all of this so seamlessly somehow and i still like to think that india advanced in um, it for because of two reasons one the scientific surroundings in Bangalore. We all know there was Indian Institute of Science, there was Raman Research Institute, and then there were the public sector institutions and um, and all also, many colleges that came up. That Exactly. 
yes exactly and then and then our inherent capabilities in dealing with abstraction which in turn is related to mathematics and i think these things there should be somebody who does a deep dive into this you know maybe that's a subject that should be the subject of your next book how the public sector companies and uh, existence of scientific institutions shape bangalore but i have become... another yes a, a bangalore is definitely a crucible but it's not limited only to bangalore you know that's why it attracts talent uh, i mean there are people who are writing code in remote parts of india you would never think that there is any civilization there but they are brilliant they may not be able to communicate with each other or with us as articulately uh, you know use the language but they can do coding and how did it reach there and those are the ones who all come here and who are doing tremendous work it's fantastic absolutely and i take your absolutely point I here no i no you are absolutely right and in fact one of the things i used to like a lot was when i was taking the buses in bangalore i don't like traveling so much by car and here in a few years back pre covid years when i would take long distance buses from whitefield to see my mother or to iisc or to places like that it would be so amazing to hear these different people who are obviously working in the it sector or in the outsourced you know call centers and so on they would so effortlessly switch from telugu you keeping a few keywords you know python mein wo lagao isme a coding mein na c c++ mein ye aisa karo wo aisa karo see effortlessly moving between the technical words in their area and the language that they were familiar with and i always knew that that was one of the handicaps for students not being able to discuss science or maths among themselves in india because they have created technical words maybe multitude multitude of technical words for one english word and which shouldn't be the case i always like to say that mathematics is a language by itself no other language should become a barrier to somebody to learn mathematics or to excel in mathematics but we have beautifully created these barriers <laughs> <laughs> so that's a you know instead of beautifully creating a uh, a new formula we have created barriers i suppose right and we need to remove them and technology makes that possible and in fact the government should be focusing on that how do we create resources but of course the government will say we are focusing on that but now it's a problem of plenty that the teachers are so afraid to even go near them itna sara hai hum kis se kya le lo just give them something simple basic resources which will help them teach better right the problem of plenty is very baffling to deal with and they have enough workload and enough restrictions in how they are supposed to work that's true right so coming back to you suja what next what's next on your agenda now that you won the padma shri uh, what do you plan to do uh, what i don't know india yeah, i mean uh, i just you know it's great to see youngsters who like the subject talk to them guide them and then i still dream of working with teachers and creating these resources and then you know hoping that these resources will actually transform i i have seen students i have mentored a few students who have completely got where they are just by using the single internet cafe in their village that's outstanding and so much more and in india every other district i'm sure has one motivated child like that you know student like that and if we just find them identify them uh, the previous director of uh, sorry secretary of dst you know, 20 years back ram sami you know, that was he, he was the uh, secretary of department of science and technology and he would say the problem is we always want to look for ramanujans whereas what we should be doing is finding more ram samis and i believe in that i believe that we need to first create a minimum competence rather than dreaming of a nobel prize whereas the government's focus is how do we get the next nobel prize so they never focus on how do we bring up these vast number of students who are competent and how do we raise their level of competence that's a very good suggestion and perhaps that they can take a leap out of what they're doing currently in uh, various sports so yes like you said what you need is to get people of a certain competence and the brilliant ones will emerge from that pool you cannot go yes. finding the brilliant one sitting somewhere in some little town or village right you got to yeah. create the breeding ground and from there one will emerge but for the most part the rest of them will be doing excellent work yeah that's what we need yes and just in terms of sheer human resources you know we have all these excellent institutions we have isro we have the department of atomic energy we have bark we have tifr we have this 
uh, ICERs, IITs and so on. Where are we going to find the next generation of talented people to take up positions in these institutions if you don't improve the level broadly? So do you want to use this platform now to make some kind of an appeal? Are you looking for more people to collaborate with you in what you're doing in terms of creating more resources for uh, maths educators or science educators? Definitely. And I would like, you know, teachers to come forward. This should become a movement by the teachers and sincere educators, you know, not not a startup which is dreaming to become the next unicorn and acquire, you know, the next set of uh, ed tech startups and so on. I don't believe in that. I believe that what you need is passion. And that sadly, you know, we seem to be lacking in that. To fix this, you only need passion and commitment. You don't need money. Or you need money, but a very small amount of money. A little money will go a long way if there is passion and commitment attached to it. Absolutely, yeah. So if right now it seems the opposite. There's a lot of money, but very little passion and commitment. So we get nowhere. You know? You're right about that. And <laughs> if anyone who's listening to the podcast would like to get in touch with you, should they write to the foundation? Is there an email ID that you would like to share? Um, sujata.kcom, the one that you write to me usually in, they can write to that address. Sujata, S-U-J-A-T-H-A dot K-C-O-M. K-C-O-M, yeah. Right. All right. I mean, they can just, say, I think even on the Gyanom website, they can, you know, volunteer, they can write offering their expertise and say what they can contribute towards and then we will get in touch with them but it's also more effective if they write to me directly and they can include a short bio and why, how they would like to contribute they can go to the Gyanom page read up all the vision statements mission statements look at the resources that we have created so far and then write about how they can help how they can pitch in so right now we are in the uh, place where we are making presentations aligned to the chapters in the ninth standard textbook and what I would really like is because many students ask me and these are the kind of many of them think that mathematics, you know, what is there in mathematics to learn? And then many of them at the same time are baffled. Why do we have to learn about negative numbers? Why do we have to learn about complex numbers? So my plan is to sort of include and there are enough resources on the Internet. You just have to curate and make these additions, which will tell a curious student why complex numbers are necessary. And I have a couple of presentations. I work with another NGO and. Uh, told them to put together a brief presentation explaining why rockets can't go up without mathematics. Oh, fantastic. I think that would be really, really interesting. And I do hope that uh, people come forward to collaborate with you and uh, realize this vision that you have for making maths more joyous to students as well as teachers in India. Yeah, especially to public school teachers and students, Sandhya. So thanks so much, Sandhya, for hosting this. Thank you. Thank you so much, Suja. And to our listeners, I hope you enjoyed this episode of Spotlight with Sandhya as much as I did. Do subscribe to the podcast. I would love to hear from you. The links are in the bio below. I'll be back soon with another interesting guest. Until then, take care and bye-bye.